think that, that science is like swimming in an ocean. It's swimming in an ocean at night. So it's uh, dangerous, but at the same time, it's extremely enjoyable. For someone who has uh, been swimming in Greece at night, uh, uh, this is probably one of the best experiences you can have. The least thing that you can uh, imagine is that you might drown one day or that there might be sharks around, <laughs> but uh, it is what it is. And uh, we have to live in being able to swim in that ocean. I'm still searching to find out uh, who Johnny and is. Uh, I, I think that uh, when I find out uh, who that person is, it, it will be so final that it has no value any longer. So it is the iteration, it's the process, it's the travel, it's the trip that, that matters the most. And uh, that person changes, it changes uh, all the time. Uh, so when I know exactly who it is, probably it wouldn't matter. <laughs> world do you want to live? Um, in a world that I can shape, that I can help shape, and that other people are also free to help shape. Uh, in a world that is respectful of all of us, and uh, that uh, humans have value. I, th I think that I worry about a world where humans have less and less value that other things have value. It could be money or artificial intelligence or uh, whatever, or, or maybe we don't even know what has value. Maybe nothing has value any longer. Uh, and maybe that's a problem. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to feel that humans and humanity has value. And uh, that's something that is not to be secured unless you're willing to help that happen. It doesn't happen automatically. There's, there's lots of stakeholders out there who don't really care that much about humans and humanity. Death is uh, a, a beautiful woman uh, that you can be in love with, but you don't want to meet. But it is that love affair that probably drives our entire life, in a sense. And it puts it into some perspective. Perfect. It uh, gives it some perspective about why are we living and why are we doing why or whatever we're doing. I can be happy with uh, with uh, very minor things. Uh, just a sunny day, uh, just uh, looking at the sea, swimming, uh, being with family. Uh, the, the, the mere act of breathing can make me happy. So I, I'm more happy when I'm also occupied with things. So when I have lots of things to think about and ponder and, and try to work on, uh, I'm a little bit of, of a, a workaholic in, in that regard. So. Uh, but I can be happy with very different combinations of, of, of what might occupy me. <laughs> liked a, a lot of things, even as a little kid. I, I, I liked very different things. Uh, I, I, I was seen as a child prodigy because I, I was writing novels when I was uh, four or five and, and poetry, and I could do mathematical calculations when I was four and, and work with equations when I was eight. And, uh, and I, I also had experience in a medical environment because both my parents are, are physicians. So I I didn't want, I didn't know what to do with my life in a sense, and, and I, I enjoyed doing lots of things. I was trying my hands uh, 
in different uh, venues of, uh, of writing and, uh, and science and, and medicine and, and health. And I decided to go down the path of, of medicine mostly because I thought that that was the best way to help people, to, to save lives, to, to be there in a positive way. I, I thought, you know, how can you be more helpful to humanity? And mathematics was really great but it was too abstract. Uh, it could be used in any way. It could be used to harm humanity, <laughs> for example. And uh, writing was also fantastic, and I never thought of giving up uh, writing, but uh, again, it was very self-centered in a way. And it, I, I'm afraid that I'm very often self-centered. So I, I thought, well, ca can you help that a little bit? <laughs> medicine would be the best way to go. And then within medicine, uh, again, I had a very hard time to choose what path exactly I wanted to take for specialization. I went to internal medicine and uh, then infectious diseases and epidemiology. Uh, epidemiology is the discipline that is closest to mathematics, in a sense. It, it has a lot of quantitative uh, methods and uh, it's like the, the quantitative machinery of biomedical research. So things did fall into place. I, I tried to work in my early career uh, in bench work, in uh, uh, completely abstract mathematical work, in clinical work, in epidemiological work. I think all of these experiences were helpful in shaping my uh, skill set and also my sense of understanding that goodness, I know next to nothing. <laughs> Science is, is too broad and uh, uh, too difficult to harness. Uh, so I, I still try to have that perspective of I know next to nothing, there's lots of smart people out there, let me try to find some of them to teach me something. And I'm, I'm trying to learn every day from, from young colleagues, young of all sorts of ages, and uh, try to be stimulated. Uh, that's, that's what I enjoy the most, le learning from other people. biggest mistakes I'm sure are mine. <laughs> so I, I, I think that science is about mistakes. It's uh, about making mistakes, but trying to realize them and com compare them with what might be better evidence and hopefully correct them as quickly as possible. The, I think my, my biggest mistake, uh, and I think that others probably can think about their mistakes, is that I underestimated how much power politics and media and powers outside of science could have on science. I think that I had no clue and no preparation for this invasion of science. Uh, I, I think that the, the war on science, science surrendered immediately and, and the whole country of science was torn apart among uh, people with very different ideologies, with partisan beliefs, with uh, strong opinions, with uh, uh, power struggles with the thirst for, for power and dominance and, and conflicts. And th that, that's something that I have not witnessed before. I was not prepared for that. I, I think that I did my best, but I, I was close to ridiculously poorly prepared for that. <laughs> I think my, my preparation had been for debates with other scientists, with, with a few scientists who might be knowledgeable in the field or, or uh, are interested and sometimes very interested and are fighting for the truth, which is of course evasive for all of us, but I was not prepared to have to fight with all of these powers that had nothing to do with science. That, that's something that I, I feel a complete idiot <laughs> about. <laughs> frightening developments in the world, but I, I want to take a step back and think positive. Think about the good things about our world. Think, think about the good things about what we can achieve, uh, about the, the younger generations, about our future, about our dreams, about our creativity, about uh, how much we can do, uh, how much we can change our world for the better. There are threats all, all, all over the place. Uh, of course, we have climate change, we have war, we have pandemics, we have uh, disease, we have inequalities, we have hunger, we, we have poverty, we have all sorts of, of things to worry about. 
But the, the worst thing would be to just keep threatening people and putting that ghost of, of uh, disaster uh, that is, is coming to us. Because if we do that, disaster will come to us sooner or later. And, and, and we will just create it with our own hands. We, we, we just need to stay calm, stay focused, stay peaceful, and stay committed to each other. And uh, don't think of the world as a hostile place, as a place where we need to compete and destroy others. We need to have some war against entities, be that the virus or other countries or other people or, or other uh, communities. Uh, we, we, we need to get back to some sense of belonging and believing and, and mutual understanding. And, and I think that the pandemic just took us very far from that. It, it instilled tremendous fear, as I said initially with the virus, then with the vaccines, then with whatever, and then that was passed over to the war. We just need to, to regain that ground that we have lost and, and try to be positive about what we can achieve as human beings. These have been uh, two and a half or close to three years now that have been really tough for the whole world. Uh, I don't think that any of us could predict what would have happened. I don't think that we can predict what will happen even in the future after we've gone through all of this. But we know in the big picture that this is a crisis that we were unprepared. This is a price crisis that uh, I think many of us, we did the best that we could, but I think we made lots of errors. We made lots of miscalculations. We made a lot of uh, mispredictions. We took lots of measures that probably uh, we should not have taken. Uh, this is not to blame anyone, but I, I think that it's a learning experience for all of us. The, the number of measures that we threw against the virus and against uh, the crisis and against the circumstances that were generated from the crisis and the pandemic were really thousands of different measures. It was not one thing that we did. Uh, Every politician, every public health official, every county, every state, every country, every scientist, every committee, uh, everyone responsible or irresponsible uh, was taking measures or suggesting measures or implementing measures and changing measures sometimes on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. So we, we threw in that uh, kitchen sh sink of, of probably tens of thousands of measures against the virus. And, to be honest, I doubt whether more than a handful of them uh, were really effective. Uh, we, we did lots of things that probably did very little to help and probably caused substantial damage because anything that we do can have some collateral damages down the road. For children and for young people, uh, they suffered pretty much the collateral damages with very little benefit from everything that we did. The, the reason for that is that this particular virus, and it, of course each virus is different, and when it, uh, it broke uh, first time, we just didn't know uh, how it would behave. But, but this one, we were fortunate that uh, kids and, and young people were relatively protected. Uh, and not that they could not be infected, they, they were massively infected. So after a couple of years, uh, practically almost the entire population has been infected, including children and young adults. Uh, but the severity of the disease and the impact of the disease, uh, let alone the death risk, uh, once you go to young ages and children and adolescents, is extremely low. Uh, it's not zero. Uh, so it is an infection that we always need to consider seriously, like any other disease. Uh, but. We have very strong documentation that the risk of death, for example, increases about threefold for every 10 years, and it's also associated with frailty and with uh, other uh, diseases or, or comorbid conditions that someone may have. So for, for children, the, the risks of suffering something serious were enormously uh, minimal, <laughs> and at the same time, everything that we did, or almost everything, was really creating problems to children. 
It was creating problems to their education. It was creating problems to their socializing. It was creating problems to their mental health, to their psychology, to, to their uh, ability to, to grow in a world that made sense. I, I think that the world very often does not make sense to adults, and we, we see that, and I think a lot of people got even more depressed and very anxious during the pandemic. But for children, it was really the apocalypse in a sense because they had far less experience and suddenly they, they saw a world that was completely unnormal and completely weird in their eyes. So I, I think that it's very difficult to measure some of these consequences and some of these repercussions, but I, I'm really sorry that much of what we did, closing down schools, keeping uh, children without being able to socialize, without being able to, to function, uh, really created major problems that we will see the repercussions downstream, unfortunately. When will this pandemic end? It depends on, on how you define the uh, pandemic phase. Uh, so we have a new virus and it is spread around the world. Using the term pandemic is probably a good choice, even though if you go to dictionaries of epidemiology, you will see that there's ambiguity about the use of that term, and people have revisited the definition now and then. But I think it's, it's a good use of the term. It was a crisis, it was a pandemic crisis. If you want to have the majority of the population have some immunity to that virus, uh, not perfect immunity, but some immunity, either because they were infected or because they were vaccinated, I think in most places around the world by the end of 2021, uh, we had reached that point. Uh, I would argue in New York, probably we reached that in 2020 because a very large segment of the population got infected very quickly. In a place like Germany, I think it was late 2021. In some places, probably it was early 2022. In most places, I think the pandemic phase ended at that point, probably at about the time that you had the, the first wave of Omicron. Uh, even in places that had not been widely infected before with Omicron. We had very widespread infection. Then we had other variants, B4, B5, who knows what will be in the fall and winter and, and spring. There's always unpredictability about it, but I, I believe that that should be seen as the endemic phase. So I, I believe that uh, this virus will not go away. I would be the most happy person to see it disappear, but it doesn't seem to be the sort of virus that disappears. And uh, how many people will be affected? Uh, I estimate that probably maybe we had close to 10 billion infections already, uh, including almost everyone in the world, other than maybe some places in China who got infected. In most places, I think 70, 80, 90 percent or more of the population are already infected. A large share have been infected twice. Some have been infected three times. So uh, this will continue. And unless, as a society, we destroy ourselves with climate change or with nuclear war, uh, perhaps we should wish that this virus kills tens of billions of people because we survive as a human species. And if we survive for millions of years, this virus probably will be with us, much like influenza has been with us. Influenza has killed one to two billion people already from the start of the, the human species. And, uh, and unless we make ourselves disappear, it will continue killing billions of people downstream if there's still human history. I, I think that uh, I will start with lockdown. Lo lockdown is a series of multiple measures. It's not one measure, it's thousands of measures that are implemented. And I don't want to say that none of them worked. I think that some of them probably did have some benefit in slowing down the dispersion of the, the virus in the community. But the vast majority of measures that, that we followed probably did not. And, and to be honest, almost none of them, probably none of them, had any serious evidence base when we took them. Back in very early 2020, I have to apologize that I was in favor of lockdown. You know, many people asked me and I said, we have no clue what this virus is and uh, what its fatality is and what its risk profile and uh, how people would be affected and how easily it's spreading and how even it's spreading in what ways. So I said it makes sense until we get some sense about these very basic features of the virus. 
to go with a very stringent approach and try to avoid having people infected. So lockdown was on the table. I said that's okay for a couple of weeks, for a few weeks, to see where we are. Very quickly, we knew where we are. We, we knew what kind of virus we were dealing with. We knew that it had a very sharp, uh, steep age gradient in its risk. Uh, we knew that it had much higher risk for specific type of vulnerable people. We also knew that it was very easily spreading. Uh, it was spreading also among asymptomatic people. So it, it was not something that it would be easy to just uh, go with a zero COVID policy. It would be almost equivalent to saying that I'm going to pinch molecules of air in place and keep them there and not allow them to move. Th that was completely crazy. And it didn't make sense because lockdown with all these thousands of measures uh, was so disruptive in many aspects of physical health, mental health, social health, the economy, our understanding of, of who we are and, and what we do and, and how we live. So I, I believe that the, the stringent lockdown approaches based on what we know now, where we see that they didn't really save lives and at the same time they created all that series of problems was not a good idea. Not to blame anyone, because as I said, I, I was one of them who said in the beginning we should try it, but be very, very careful because we need to pay close attention to all the negative consequences that may emerge. Masks were one among many measures in, in the series of efforts to try to contain the, the spread of the virus in the community. And compared to others, like shutting down schools or uh, shutting down the economy or, or letting people... Uh, unhelped with all their problems in the middle of, of crisis, I didn't see them as being so disruptive. You know, it, it, it was something that probably could be done. Most people could do it with, without a problem. Uh, did it help a lot? Probably it helped a little bit based on what we know. We have two randomized trials. One suggested that uh, masks didn't have any benefit for people who were wearing it. Uh, that was the Danish study. And a study in Bangladesh suggested that it decreased the risk of transmission by about 10%. Uh, so 10% uh, on a relative scale, which means that if 1% was infected in the control group, then 0.9% uh, was infected in the group that, that got the mass. So it, it's, it's a very small benefit, and you have to balance that against the inconvenience or, or the sense of, of uh, irregularity that, that they create. So in, in a very acute epidemic wave, especially when you have unprotected populations, you have highly vulnerable populations, you have unvaccinated populations, you have crowding and uh, big events with uh, how, thousands of people mixing. I think it, it makes sense. It's something easy and I think it can be done. If we see masks as something that is to be carried forward and kind of affect our daily life and, and have little kids that have close to zero risk uh, wear masks all the time in their educational environment, I think that's crazy. That makes absolutely no sense. And I, I think that it, it creates more disruption. It, it kind of perpetuates a feeling of pandemic uh, crisis, even in settings that we should not be feeling that there is a pandemic crisis any longer. Many measures cause more harm than, than benefit. Uh, and I, I think that we need to look very carefully at what we did and what a kind of an impact uh, each one of the measures had. It's difficult to be precise because uh, other than a few things like masks, for example, where we only had a couple of randomized trials, in most of the other measures, we just adopted them without any randomized trials. It was just a few experts or a few politicians or a few policy people or a few completely ignorant people, actually, who were very powerful in social media, who said, we need to do this. And, and then there was a domino effect, and people did this. And now we're just scratching our heads to, to say, who said that? <laughs> because really, that was not in our textbooks. That was not in our studies that had been done or are being done. That was not what science uh, was telling us. It, it was what panic and fear and uh, the best will, you know, good intentions to, to save the world, <laughs> in a sense, was dictating at a time that there was very little room for evidence-based approaches and for common sense, let alone for science. It, it, it was all, uh, if you don't do that, uh, then you are a, a bad person. You want to kill people and uh, you, you, you're horrible. 
And I, I think that we did a lot of damage that will be very difficult even to appraise its depth. Uh, I think we see the consequences now. We see the consequences on a major impact on mental health in any survey that has been done. We see the consequences at the level of uh, societal meltdown. We see the consequences at the level of uh, uh, disadvantaged minorities, marginalized populations, poor populations, poor countries having an extra burden, although no country is spared. We see uh, an estimate of 950 million people who are in hunger in 2022. Uh, the numbers were in the range of 600 million in 2015 to 2020, and they escalated almost by 50% within a couple of years. And we see also the consequences now in children in, in wide scale. The, the, the problem is not so much to try to find who did this and point a finger and create even more crisis and ask for retribution and retaliation, because I, I think this is leading nowhere. I think that we need to recognize our mistakes but not try to create a further blame culture because this is just propagating further the pandemic fear and the, the sense of, of, uh, of war, in a sense, within society. What matters is to deal with these negative uh, repercussions that we have created. And I, I feel very worried because I mentioned uh, hunger and almost one billion people who are under that category of hunger around the world. And uh, I heard, for example, that the, the G7 uh, leaders summit uh, pledged $4.5 billion for hunger around the world for, for these 950 million people. Just the US alone gave $5 trillion for pandemic stimulus for COVID-19. Uh, so so we, we completely blew up our economies and our societies for something that I'm not saying it was not important. It, it was important, but it was one of multiple problems. And we, we just invested all our efforts, all our resources, all our money, all our attention, all our panic, all our politicians, all our social media, all our media to that theme and left everything else go astray. I, 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 that's, that's really what I worry about. Uh, would mean that uh, we, we try to get back to some sort of normality. And uh, one option is to try to forget about it. Uh, to, to be honest, uh, at, at this point, I'm, I'm even wondering, should I be talking about COVID-19? Because I, I just give more ammunition to people to talk about that uh, same topic again. Or should we just try to just get rid of it, just forget it, just move on with our lives? There's lots of things that uh, are not helping us to, to do that because uh, we, we still have that encasement within this super diagnostic framework with extensive testing and contract tracing and, and still many measures being around, and many of them being implemented, again, with no evidence base uh, and putting a lot of people under a lot of pressure. Uh, there's still mandates or, or semi-mandates or, or, or indirect nudging and pressure to people to do specific things. So it's very difficult to just forget about it. And uh, of course, there's other problems that humanity is facing. We have, as I said, hunger and starvation and mental health and war, unfortunately, and, and a lot of instability. So there's a new wave of fear that is replacing coronavirus. But to me, it's the same primal fear that is being transformed. And uh, you know, we had coronavirus that was the, the big fear, and then vaccines became the, the big fear, and we had conspiracies that, in the first place, it was coronavirus killing people, and then it was vaccines killing people, and, and, and now it's war killing people, and it, it does kill people, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I think that we have to find some peace. We have to find some sense of social responsibility, social cohesiveness, uh, respect for others, respect within ourselves to start with, and then within our families, within our communities, across countries. Uh, I, I think what I worry a lot is that coronavirus and the response to it were so extreme that now 
people think that everything is allowed, that everything is possible. You know, we shut down everything. We destroyed the economy. We destroyed our kids. We, we destroyed ourselves. We can destroy ourselves in other ways as well. You know, we can do it with war, with nuclear war, with the climate change. Uh, it's, it's so simple. We, we did it with coronavirus. Why don't we do it again? We can do it in, in large scale. So somehow that moral switch has been activated. And, and this is what I worry about. And I, I'm trying very desperately to turn that switch down <laughs> again. I think that um, th there was a problem in scientific communication during the pandemic. Uh, lots of scientists jumped to the forefront to try to help. And I think that for the vast majority of them, they had good intentions. They, they wanted to help. They saw that there was a major crisis. They said, I have some skills. I have some knowledge. I want to put them forward to help my community. This is the time for me to, to offer my best. But unfortunately, most of them did not have skills or training or education or, or have never done research in fields that would be relevant to the crisis. So, so we had a lot of people who very well intentioned uh, started uh, screaming a lot uh, in media, in social media, putting also their scientific tag at the bottom as a sense of credibility. We had politicians who gave them credibility by adopting them as experts or as advisors, even though for someone who knew the field, they would know that, well, that person knows nothing about this. But now he's the number one expert in the country and he's running the show. And he has more power than any dictator could have had in the history of humankind. And, and for, for serious scientists, uh, there, there was that debate. I mean, do we really try to join that uh, party of madness? Do we try to continue doing our job, which takes time, takes effort? Uh, we make a lot of errors in the process. We make a lot of mistakes. We try to correct them. It's an iterative process. Uh, we cannot give you an answer right now in five minutes. I want an answer. Should I close down the schools? <laughs> and should I close down everything? And uh, it was a, a real challenge. And I think that people who were less trained in the scientific method and more confident in themselves in the wrong way, probably had the upper hand. And they spread a narrative that was not completely false, but very largely false, and created a lot of problems to scientists who were using the more traditional scientific approach to counter this. At the same time, you had tremendous pressure from media and social media, which we knew from the pre-pandemic years that journalists are not trained in science. It, it, it's something that we knew very well. We, we knew that even science journalists are clueless about science most of the time. However, they write about science, and they write about science in ways that most of the time has nothing to do with the scientific process. They try to find messages that are very strong and exaggerated and uh, extreme and uh, the the end of the world type of, of story. And this is not what science is about. Science is about healthy skepticism. It's about risks and benefits. It's about uh, nothing is black and white. It's not a matter of signature collection who, or getting more votes or, or, or getting more people to agree on, on this and then it is correct. It, it, the, the scientific method just completely fell out of the radar screen. And, and we had people in media, social media, politics, some cycles of science really taking up uh, the whole show and creating a complete mess. I, I, I don't want to exclude myself from this. I'm not saying this, I was correct and they were wrong. I was part of this. I, I was one scientist among many fighting in that complete chaos. And uh, we were not trained to fight in this chaos. We were trained to do other things rather than fight with powers in politics, social media, or media that use very different type of weaponry. I think all scientists are biased. I, I am biased. I I'm tremendously biased. The, the, the one thing that we try to do in science is to continuously fight against our bias. Try to understand why we believe uh, some evidence and why we don't believe and where do we base that? Uh, what kind of data do we have? Can we get better data? Can we get more transparent data?
can we get uh, uh, closer to a more accurate estimate? And, and this is not an easy process. It's a process that takes time. It's a process that takes a lot of effort. And uh, I think that you have to try to take a step back and uh, be as objective as possible. It's not an easy process. On top of this, you have biases which are due to conflicts. You, you have people who may be conflicted because they may be paid by some entity. They may have a financial interest or, or some other interest to support uh, one type of, of process or another. We knew, for example, that uh, Big Pharma, you know, uh, the industry, had very strong conflicts in trying to guide results in the biomedical literature. And of course, Big Pharma is producing some very effective medications and some very effective and useful vaccines. So it's not that they're, they're useless and they're just conflicted and they're just trying to promote uh, their products to make money. It's not like the tobacco uh, industry, which, you know, uh, again, makes $1 trillion a year, but they're just also killing 8 uh, million people every year with their products. You know, so, so they make money and they kill people. But Big Pharma makes money, but they also hopefully save lives. But in, in the pre-pandemic years, the approach was that we have to be very careful about Big Pharma because their incentives are such that they will try to bias the literature and we have to be very careful. We need to scrutinize our data. We need to put pressure on them to be more transparent, to be more open, to share, to check what they do. And very often, what they did was perfectly fine. Some other times, we need to correct it. During the pandemic, all of this was completely inversed. Big Pharma suddenly became the saviors of the world. Uh, for whatever they were producing, that was an amazing discovery, an amazing product. Everyone had to use it. Everyone had to be mandated to use it. And in some cases, maybe they had wonderful products being produced, but the, the whole mentality that even asking a question or asking for a risk-benefit calculation, for example, immediately you were classified as an outlier, as a, a conspirator, as, as someone very weird. That was something very unique. The, the moral odds were inversed. People who had no conflicts were claimed to have conflicts, and people who had conflicts were seen as the heroes and the saviors of humankind. And uh, it's a situation that still persists to a large extent, and it's going to take some time to be able to, to reverse it. Or maybe it will not be reversible. Maybe we will end up in a situation where people who are more methodologically savvy and more careful uh, are seen as outliers, and people who just want to maximize profit for the industry are seen as the way to go, as, as the wave of the future of, of morality, of, of ethics, uh, which, which is something very dangerous, I believe, because it, it completely reverses what we know about science and about the interface between industry and science. So during the, the pandemic, uh, within uh, two years or a little bit over two years, we published close to half a million papers. And uh, about one million different scientists published these papers. Uh, they came from all ways of life. Uh, science is divided into 174 fields. And uh, all 174 fields of science published something on, on coronavirus and, and COVID-19 and, and the pandemic. Most of these papers were of very low quality. However, they dominated science. Uh, we, we have run some analysis that show that uh, in the early pandemic uh, years, uh, 98 of the top 100 most cited papers in the scientific literature were on COVID-19. Uh, now, for a topic that is very important, you expect maybe one, two, maybe three papers out of the top 100 across all science to be related to that topic. Uh, 98 out of 100 means that science was entirely absorbed by uh, coronavirus. Much of that science was of low quality, and much of that science was not transparent. And uh, I think that that showed. We had a, a number of very high profile retractions, for example. We had a paper published in The Lancet that uh, claimed that it had collected data from hundreds of hospitals around the world. No hospital had any clue that that study had happened and the paper was completely fake. Uh, we had other situations where very high profile questions were raw data, you know, access to data, transparency would have made all the difference. One classic example is, is the leak theory for, for the virus leaking from a laboratory. That was a very simple situation where the Wuhan lab should have released the data for all the experiments that they were running. 
they should release that to the scientific community. The scientific community should see that. They can judge with that what was done could have led to the possibility of a lab leak. It hasn't happened, at least until now, that we're discussing. I hope it does by the time the interview comes out, but I'm not really very optimistic. I want to believe that the virus was just a natural evolution event, but if that most crucial question, we cannot have transparency, we cannot have data sharing, then one wonders, is really science open? Is it transparent? Is it believable? How, how much can we believe? Uh, another example, I'm one of the strongest supporters of, uh, of vaccines. I, I believe that vaccines were one of the very big successes in this pandemic. However, I do want to see the raw data from the clinical trials. And again, until this point, it's practically impossible to get the full raw data from, from these trials. I, I don't see that that should be such a big issue. The claims that there might be conspirator theorists who take these data and run wild, of course that can happen with anything, but if you have raw data for something, then you can put more trust to that. There's, there's many, many examples where some of the chronic problems of science, which are lack of transparency, lack of uh, healthy skepticism, lack of uh, risk-benefit ratio considerations, uh, lack of uh, uh, communalism, which means that you share with the wider community, they became very sharply uh, enhanced during the pandemic. And many people started losing their trust to science because of this. They, they felt that science was encroaching on their rights, on their freedoms, on their life, on their uh, everyday expectations. And at the same time, it was happening in a, in a very esoteric mode that only a few people had control of the data. And uh, somehow then decisions were imposed about them while the data were not available for others to see. Uh, sometimes there were no data at all, which was e even worse, or, or data that were evidently of very low quality. It, it, it was a challenge. It was like a crash test for science to, to see whether we can survive in an environment where everybody is looking at us, not just our fellow scientists, not just a few people who are in the field, in the specific sub, sub, sub field, but the whole community is looking at us. And what do we say? Well, we have no data, or we have poor data, or we have no data, but we're not sharing them with you. So <laughs> none of these three situations is, is very nice. Conversely, we say, oh, but we have half a million papers. Most of them are very poor quality. And we have about half a million decisions that encroach on your life. That's not the best light for science to gain a name in the community as being the best that can happen to humans. Because my, my belief is that science is the best thing that can happen to humans. But it should be transparent, it should be shareable, it should be able to be validated and, and proven with arguments that it is so and it is not different from what it is being presented. Is, is very unpredictable. Uh, it can be a bright future or it can be a very dark future. I think that uh, we have more tools, we have more data, we have more ability to collect information and analyze information. We have more fancy ways of, uh, of going after asking questions and addressing them and getting answers. We have uh, great advances in, in biotechnology, in bioengineering, in artificial intelligence. Uh, our, our capacity is clearly at a much higher level compared to what it was even 10 years ago. So there's good hope on, on one side. On, on the other side, I think that there's still very strong conflicts of interest. There's still a lot of uncertainty about many of these tools, whether they can really come up uh, with uh, uh, deliverables for the promises that have been launched. And I, I think that uh, there's also a dark side of, of medicine in that medicine can also serve itself rather than serve the patient or, or the citizen when it comes to, to public health. Uh, too much medicine is not a good thing. Too much public health is not a good thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we should invest more in, in, the, in the war industry <laughs> compared to, to medicine, please don't get me wrong, or to tobacco, which uh, again made more money during uh, the pandemic. It increased its sales by 2% every year. Uh, but medicine is good when it is in proportion to the problem. 
It is bad when it creates problems that do not exist or it exaggerates problems that do not exist. So if you invest in a given field of medical research or medical practice or public health practice, and you say, I'm giving you more money, I'm giving you more resources, and then the problem goes away or the problem becomes much smaller or maybe the problem was not as big as you thought and these resources continue to be spent, then you have a problem, you have a mismatch, you have people who might directly or indirectly have a conflict of interest to propagate that problem or to create an even bigger problem so that they can justify their existence. And this is something that I worry about also with coronavirus. See, even if the virus were to go away, for example, which will not, but at least become endemic and not be such a big problem, all of that investment will continue to have a legacy upon how much we believe that it is a problem and how much we should talk about it and how much we should invest on it and how much research should just focus on this and not on many other aspects of health, which might be far, far more important. We, we, we give close to nothing to study things like starvation uh, or hunger or poverty or war or uh, you know, major problems that make our health systems dysfunctional in most countries around the world, but, but even in, in wealthy countries, I, I think that there's still lots of dysfunctional aspects. And conversely, I, I see all these minute details about coronavirus. Even now, I, I still get emails about a single case being detected in some building and uh, uh, a whole series of measures that are being taken to do something about it and to feel that we have in invested in enough resources to this. So it's, it's creating a new bubble of uh, means and resources. And the means and resources of science and of society and of our communities are not endless. They're limited. So we have to be very wise. If, if we invest everything in one basket, we have far less to invest or nothing to invest in other areas that are more important. And it, it, and it is very sad. Uh, and I, I think that uh, we need some sort of a reset to be able to reappraise what are we doing and, and where are we heading? And what do we expect? What, what do we expect of medicine? What do we expect of healthcare? What do we expect of public health? What are our anticipations? What are our goals? What are our priorities? Is our goal to go back to zero COVID? That I think this will never happen. Is our goal to diminish one burden of disease to a given level? What is good enough? What is not good enough? What about other diseases? What about other conditions? What about other social welfare? What about education? What about uh, uh, the, the future of, of our societies at large? I, I, I think we are completely unbalanced at the moment. We, we are in, in the middle of a series of crises that one crisis propagates uh, the other. We just don't know what would uh, hit next. Many people feel very uneasy about it. Very people feel very anxious. Very people uh, get extremely angry or, or uh, maybe sometimes uh, uh, elated <laughs> in, in the wrong way uh, about that crisis and, and they want to scream and shout and, uh, and complain. Uh, I, I think all of that is really creating a lot of problems and a meltdown of, of our societies, even in societies that are democratic and hopefully they should have resources and some resistance to, to meltdown. But if you are not in the mainstream uh, opinions, you get problems. So what are your experiences? I cannot complain. Uh, I, I think that uh, in, in my experience, I published uh, so many papers on COVID-19, I polluted the literature probably heavily with some 60 peer-reviewed papers. Uh, but I believe that for people who were probably less uh, known and less visible, it was very difficult to take positions that would be seen at a given moment as being not within the mainframe, within the, the main narrative. I, I think that sometimes, even for myself and for other colleagues who are very senior and established and, and well-known, it was not very easy. Uh, and uh, one would have to uh, kind of question, is, is it worthwhile to get all that pushback? Uh, and and uh, we had lots of experiences of, of pushbacks. I, I received death threats. Uh, there was a, a hoax in, in social media that almost killed my mother. She, 
they, they said that she had died of COVID-19 and, and started getting massive phone calls at her home asking her for her funeral. She had a hypertensive crisis and, and she almost died. Uh, so th th there are some points where you, you say, is it worth it to do research if my life and even more the, the life of my family members are, is put at risk? Is it uh, worthwhile to just be exact and, and give the exact estimate and the exact uncertainty if I have to deal with all these social media people who are anonymous, pseudonymous, or they carry a name, uh, but they don't really care about it because they have nothing to lose. They're just there to smear and to attack or to fight against journalists who uh, are likely to distort the message just because they have been given some order or they have been convinced that this is how it should be. Uh, how, how should the scientists behave in this situation? I, I, I witnessed that in large scale, both for myself and for many other colleagues. I think uh, it's hard to think of some scientist who was really a good scientist who didn't get stressed during this pandemic. I, I, I think that probably a few uh, who uh, didn't care that much and maybe they were very willing to go with the flow, uh, maybe they did well, maybe even those though were attacked. But uh, anyone who wanted to do a serious job and, and be honest and, and be accurate, uh, that was not an easy time. And uh, there are surveys now that show that uh, a large share of scientists got these same experiences. So uh, I, I, I respect tremendously and I feel very sorry for th those people who had these experiences and who had the opposite views to mine. Uh, for those who had the same views to mine, I mean, that's fine, you know, we, we tried to say what we wanted to say, but those who had opposite views and were attacked, I feel very, very sorry because I, I think this is not what a scientist should have to worry about, that uh, what's happening to politicians and social media and media and who, who's going to attack me next. <laughs> it's, it's, it has nothing to do with science and it should have nothing to do with science. I, I think that uh, science should be separate from politics. I, I, I feel very sad when uh, politics interfere in science, when they uh, somehow shape science and, and when they dictate what science should be. And I think that this happened during the pandemic, maybe in a defensive way because of politicians wanting to defend their decisions and because of some eager scientists who are willing to take positions to please politicians. I think that they should be very separate. It's extremely important for science to be independent, completely independent, not to be hostage to, to politics. Media, I think, also have a very prominent role. And I'm afraid that media uh, were very detrimental in many ways uh, during the pandemic because they, they took sides. They, they took sides without knowing the science, without uh, having any understanding of the science, just in a, in a very partisan way. And uh, it was equally bad when it was partisan way for the right or for the left or for the alt-right. I think they all became extremists in a sense uh, and they all harmed science and they all harmed society at the end of the day. I, I think that science should be able to give nuance, to give some uh, second thought, some, some sort of, of moderation and some sort of, of, of mutual respect in, in society. Uh, and I, I, I'm very much worried that what happened fueled extremism in different forms, in, in different forms in different countries, depending on what their political mix might have been. But extreme voices were strengthened during the pandemic. And uh, conspiracies and conspirator theorists, I think, became very prominent and very famous and, and infamous. People who tried to fight with them, they sometimes used the same means that conspirator theorists use and they became conspirator theorists themselves. So, so that's, that's, that's really bad. You have misinformation and disinformation fought with more misinformation and more disinformation. That, that's not the way to, to deal with that problem. I think we should make sure that our children are back to living normal lives. I think that there's absolutely no indication, at least now that we're talking, that uh, there should be any restrictions on what they do, on how they're educated, on, on how they go about uh, living their lives, enjoying their lives, learning, experiencing, socializing, uh, doing whatever matters and, and whatever they can do. Uh, most of what we do uh, really posed a heavy burden on them. 
it posed an even heavier burden to uh, children who were not wealthy, who were disadvantaged. Uh, I think wealthy children did probably uh, substantially better during that crisis because they had the means to overcome the restrictions both in terms of how they would get educated and also how they would even socialize. So I think that I cannot justify any measure at this point that would put any limitations on children. And uh, we, we need to find ways to give back what uh, we have taken away from them. Uh, I think that they have lost two or three years almost from uh, their lives. And uh, uh, we need to find ways to, to repent in, in a way for, for that major loss. I, I don't want to be pessimistic. I think that children can adapt. I think that they can learn. I think that they can gain back more easily. Uh, but I, I, we need to, to go back to, to respecting them. It's, it's, it's very sorry that many of our decisions, in a way, we're putting our children as a shield to protect us. You know, <laughs> uh, like, you know, for, for many months, probably a year or more, you know, the, the, the whole debate about children was not really for children, but for really protecting uh, adults from the dangerous children and, and creating a sense to children that they're dangerous and they're dangerous to each other and they're dangerous to adults, which, which is c completely horrible. It's, it's like the, the worst thing that one can do for human beings in general, you know, e even elderly people and, and adults, but for, for children even more so. So I think we should just let them live and let them enjoy. And I would say that we should let people live also in general, but, but that applies even more in the case of children. Would you vaccine a child with six months? Or I'm happy that we have vaccines. I, 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 as I said from the beginning, I was the happiest person when I saw that vaccines could be developed so quickly. I think that should be a, a decision of the parents. We should just give them the data. We should just tell them this is the risk, this is the benefit, this is how much we know, this is what we do not know. We should be very honest about how much we do not know. If someone asks me what might happen 10 years down the road, I have no clue because this is 10 years down the road. Do I believe that they, it will be a complete disaster, that these vaccines will just cause massive cancer and people will be dying like flies? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Why? Based on what we call priors. You know, my prior experience has not been that I have seen that be the case for other things that we have developed. But we need to be honest about what the benefits are and what the risks are and let people decide. No mandates, no pressure, no indirect pressure, like you cannot travel unless you get vaccinated, you cannot work unless you do this, you cannot do that. Uh, I think this is just destroying trust to public health. But it's horrible to just put pressure and make people feel that they're in jail and they're not gonna come out unless you, know, you do this, because I know exactly what needs to be done. I don't know exactly what needs to be done. I think that I have some data. I'm going to present them to you. I think it's a good idea to do this, but it's up to that person, in the case of kids, up to parents to decide whether they want to do this, because otherwise we end up in an endless problem because this virus is not going away. So are we going to go with a series of these type of indirect strong recommendations and mandates that will go forever and then a fourth dose, a fifth dose, a tenth dose, a one millionth dose, it, it, it makes absolutely no sense. At the same time, we need to get better data. So instead of putting pressure on the community and on parents and on people to do this because otherwise they cannot live their lives, we should get the right type of studies. We should get randomized controlled trials that give us in larger populations, in more diverse populations, with longer follow-up, with more detailed data collection, what happens when we take one route versus we take another route. It's very unfortunate that we don't do that. We, we just do a, a few randomized trials that have relatively small sample size. They look okay. I want to believe that they are okay. I'm, I'm not saying that they're not okay. I do not agree with people who say that vaccines are killing people massively. I, I think that that's completely wrong. I, I've looked at these data, I don't see that. But I'm very much in favor of getting rigorous data. And now that we're out of the pandemic waves and out of the crisis and we're in the endemic phase and we will probably have to live with the virus, we need very precise knowledge about what is the benefit of each intervention? How much can we gain? How much can we lose? And at what cost? At, at, at what cost of resources? At what cost of investment? At what cost for other aspects of uh, of requirements that may be necessary to adopt an intervention. Do you think that the 
side effects are underreported? Side effects are always underreported. This is not a new thing. So uh, we, we know from the pre-pandemic years that our culture in medicine is tilted towards benefits. So if you look at randomized trials, and I'm not talking about COVID-19, only a minority of them were reporting harms in a rigorous way and in a complete way. And the vast majority also did not have information on harms in the long term. Uh, recently, we looked across the entire Cochrane database of systematic reviews. We took a very large sample, a random sample of thousands of reviews on topics of interventions for medicine. And we tried to see how often they have very strong evidence for benefits and how often they cover harms. We saw that uh, it's only a small minority that have strong evidence for benefits. And in the majority of cases, harms are not even dealt with. So people just leave them aside. They don't say anything or they say very little. We have very poor documentation, very poor evidence about whether there might be harms. Do I believe that when this is the case, the medication or the vaccine or whatever would be harmful and it would be killing people? No. But at the same time, we have a gap. We have a knowledge gap that we need to fill in. And our systems of capturing harms through, for example, uh, passive surveillance, which is what mostly has been done for vaccines and for biologics and for drugs, we know that it's up to people and physicians and practitioners to report the events. So um, many events happen, but they don't report them. Many events, of course, are missed because they don't even realize them. Uh, if, if you have, for example, myocarditis, but you, you don't have some symptoms, even though you may have a problem with your heart muscle, then you don't really report it because you never felt it. And could that person die at some point? Yes, one in, who knows, a million or, or 100,000? Maybe that will happen, and that will be the first event that someone will just drop dead on the floor. So the rest will not be captured. And even those events that happen are not really reported much of the time because just this is the way that it has been. In the case of COVID-19, we saw also a countercurrent. We saw a lot of people who were so scared of vaccines and, and so much influenced by all that pressure that these vaccines are killing people and they're, they're horrible and, and this is a conspiracy to, to kill the entire population that they started over-reporting. So, so we had a mix. We had a component of the population that were very, very diligent to report everything, probably even to a detail that was not needed. And we had another portion of the population that was not reporting, uh, along with the practitioners and the physicians who were taking care of them. And in some cases, I even saw uh, some wonderful scientists who said, uh, I was thinking whether I should report this because I would be giving ammunition to anti-vaxxers, which I thought, my goodness, have we reached that point? I mean, to, to be afraid of anti-vaxxers, that, that would be like the, the, the best ammunition we can offer to anti-vaxxers if we say that we don't report because we are afraid of anti-vaxxers. So reporting has problems. Surveillance, passive surveillance, all these vaccine uh, recording systems, they are there, they do what they can do. They can tell us about some major problems, uh, so some things that happen far more commonly compared to normal, but for serious things that happen only a little bit more commonly, but they may be common and therefore a little bit might be substantial, they cannot tell as much. So if it's a common problem like a heart attack, if, if you have a 10% increase, would we capture that with our systems? Not really. That's not what they're designed for. Now, science has its own language, it has its own rules, it has its uh, own perspective. Uh, you cannot violate these rules. Uh, writing has its own perspective and its own rules. Uh, maybe you can violate them a bit more, <laughs> uh, which is fun if you know how to do it and if you do it in a way that uh, the final outcome is, uh, is not completely <laughs> meaningless. Um, but I, I like the complementarity. I like that, that back and forth and the ability to communicate uh, in these two worlds. I, I think it offers an ability to realize how much or how little, actually, how little uh, one knows uh, and, and how, 
how much uh, difficult it is to have meaning eventually, meaning either in terms of science or in terms of, of meaning in life. It's, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a struggle that you cannot have very high expectations, but you, you still continue with, with the goal of achieving something maybe a little better, a little bit more clear, a little bit more transparent again. So we were talking about transparency in science. There's also transparency in literature and also transparency in, in thinking and in, uh, in emotions, in, in conveying these emotions, in, in making art of, of this. Art was, was completely ignored, I believe. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, I, I was very sad because I know artists from very different ways of life and uh, art was practically suppressed. It, it was the, the most effective way to suppress art. I, I cannot think of any other regime in the past that has managed to suppress art so efficiently. Now, of course, people could continue to write at their home, uh, but for example, performances were, were banned for a long period of time. Uh, things that I enjoy. I like, uh, for example, writing libretti for operas. Operas could not be staged. I had an opera that uh, I was waiting for its premiere at the Greek National Opera, and eventually the premiere happened without an audience. It was just on video. People who are in outcomes research, I don't think that they have ever measured how much we lose in our life when we lose art, or, or we lose multiple dimensions of art, when, when you cannot communicate art, when you cannot uh, hope to have an environment that art has meaning, has the potential to, to be expressed. Time will tell whether these years were sterile in creativity. Probably they were not. I think that people still continue to be creative. But just being creative in a, a closed room without being able to communicate, I'm not sure whether that's uh, really what an artist uh, wants to be. And uh, I, I cannot translate that to quality of life but it is essential for life. Art needs freedom, it, it, it needs perfect freedom. I, I, I can understand that in the scientific method you have limitations in terms of, and some boundaries in terms of uh, how you use your methods. And in art, the first method is freedom. And uh, if you don't have the ability to, to think freely and to express yourself freely, then you cannot really do any art. Uh, now, this doesn't mean if you express yourself freely that that would be high art. I mean, it, it, it would be com possibly complete nonsense, but uh, it, it's, it's a prerequisite. And I, I think that much of that in an environment where suppression and subversion and uh, restriction becomes the norm, when security becomes the dominant theme in human life, art is not in an environment where it can thrive. Uh, art wants to dismantle security, it wants to make you insecure in a way, so that you can question again things that you have accepted and maybe they were not as correct or as, as solid as one thought. So it, it was something that probably created some of my bias, my personal bias as a scientist, because I had that other perspective that I felt, my goodness, this is so incongruent with my other side <laughs> of myself. This is completely killing my other side. Uh, so maybe I was biased uh, because of, of that reason, but I think that many people were also affected in, in the same way. They felt that much that we valued was under threat. If, if, you, remove, if you remove art, then you're left with you know, media and social media to fill in the gap, but I, I don't think that they can do that. In, in a way, it's preposterous to think that media and social media uh, or other entities can can replace art, uh, and they have done that to a large extent. I don't want to give them like 100% of the art territory. I think it's good to have some free territory of art that is independent of them, uh, regardless of how society evolves. Variation 12a. In his dreams, there often came the image of a large paved square with three stone buildings of frightening and undeniable prestige. The cathedral, the governorate headquarters, and the assembly building. Something recalling Venice, Tilofo, or Auschwitz. Well after the end of the tour season, the doors were locked. It was late afternoon. Without any light, perfect silence, nothing alive, though it was certain that once upon a time 
many people had gathered here who had exercised with and who had been exercised in these three pillars of civilization, victims and victimizers, people who have left no trace in this city reliquary. Maybe he could see again from the beginning the deserted beach of Myrtos, high from above, from that house with the purple geraniums where once upon a time the hospital anonymous strangers had opened the door to him. As they explained, they had come months ago from afar, from places that they could not tell which were which, because frankly, they had never known their names. They only remembered a sign with a gruesome landmark, Gamma 560, when they started off, but this doesn't help much. When they arrived at the house, nobody was there, but the keys were left on its front door. There were sheets and pillowcases in the drawers, so they spent the entire autumn. They assumed it was autumn, though they had never found any calendar or anything else that would prove what season this was supposed to be. The owners had not given any signs of life during all this time. Maybe there were no owners. Perhaps the general system of property ownership had been abolished. Perhaps there was no state or other inhabited world any longer. Perhaps something unusual had happened to the universe and therefore no visitor would come to the deserted beach. There were many possibilities, but they wouldn't dare get out and stray far from the house to check out these harrowing hypotheses. Now that they saw him coming, they reflected on the options and they made the decision to embark in finding some answers. They left him the keys and they departed again to search out what had happened to the world in the meanwhile, to solve the puzzle whether time still existed and whether they were still alive. So, inadvertently, by their departure, he had unwittingly inherited this beautiful iconic home and the absolute wilderness that already belonged to him by 6.25% from his father. The silence of the two anonymous bluebirds that hid in the shrubs, the Ionian sea undented and stopped like a movie on a personal computer, the Ionian sea, something that had never ever happened. Thank you.